are marked. We are marked by the lines where smiles have been, by the calluses of our labor, by the scars of our struggles, and by the strength of our prayers, all of which tell the story of who we are. Yet there's another mark, one that sets us apart from others and from who we once were. Unlike our physical marks, this mark can't be seen by human eyes, nor felt by human touch. Yet it's as present as the wind in the trees, for it is the mark of whose we are, rather than who we are. We are not our own. Our stories, our struggles, our victories, and our joys are all part of something larger something greater than ourselves. This journey we call life is not about finding ourselves so much as it is about losing ourselves and finding him. As we move toward discovering him, we become free to explore the depth and breadth of his love and his being. We realize that being a saved people doesn't mean we are a safe people set upon a shelf to await his return. No, we're not safe but rather we're sent from a comfortable place in society to the outcasts and the vulnerable, from an easy definition of friend and family to an ability to embrace the enemy with God's love from inside the church walls to a world outside that needs Jesus. Our vision is to join God in his mission to go wherever we must and do whatever it takes to penetrate the darkness and rescue the lost. We are set apart, we are marked, we are not our own, we are His. Well, good morning everyone. Welcome to Crossroads Church, my name is Jason. I'm really glad that you all are here and have joined us for winter. Yay! I was talking to somebody uh, just before the 9 o'clock service this morning, and we talked about this light switch moment that seemed to happen between October 31st and November 1st. It was like October 31st was, was cool, right? It was coolish, but then November 1st hit, and it was like, boom, it's winter. Game on. Snow and everything. So that's great. Hopefully you all have had fun just, you know, scraping windows, shoveling snow, being a good neighbor, shoveling your neighbor's driveway. If my neighbor's here, I'm giving them some hope that they'll shovel my driveway. Glad that you're here this morning. How many of you, by a show of hands, have had a second first day of high school? Just me? Okay. Second first day, second first day of high school. A second first day of high school. I said that correctly. Second first day of high school. Here's what happened to give me a second first day of high school. In grade 10, I was about 14, my parents decided about a month into the school year that they would move us from the area that we grew up into a brand new environment. So I had two weeks in the school I was familiar with, with the friends I had grown up with, played sports with, had to drop all my classes, get in a U-Haul, drive all the way to Calgary, woohoo! and then we went to a brand new school. I remember that first day because I got off that city bus and I walked into the door, I had my backpack, and all I wanted to see was a, a friendly face who would notice me. Not because I was weird, not because I used the word bunny hug instead of hoodie, not because I was dressed awkwardly or anything. I just wanted somebody to see me, to notice me, to see that I had value. And as I worked my way through the lobby and into the, into the uh, office area to get my locker and all that stuff, I was, just, I was craving someone to help me feel like I belonged. Uh, earlier this week, I hung out with a group of older friends on a Monday afternoon, and I asked them this question. I said, what would you want a pastor to know about you that maybe you don't think he or she knows? And I let them talk for a while about a variety of things, and in one way, shape, or form, they all said this, we want to be seen, we want to be noticed. And it struck me, maybe we're all alike in that way. Maybe you don't have a story of a second first day of high school where you walked into an environment in that setting and felt awkward because you didn't know anybody, but maybe that's your story here this morning. Maybe this is your first morning here. Maybe you're just new to the central Alberta region. Maybe you're new in your workplace. Maybe you have been new before and you've experienced what it means 
to want and crave belonging and looking for people to help you feel like you fit. There's a story from the life of Jesus that I think illustrates this craving of belonging really, really intentionally. And it's found in the book of Luke, chapter 19. I want to invite you to turn along there with me. If you've got a Bible, either a paper one or an on your device, your your phone or your iPad or tablet or something, app your way there, Luke chapter 19. I'm gonna be reading from the New Living Translation. That's gonna be different than maybe some of the ones that you have, and that's okay. There's one in front of you as well, also a Bible in front of you. You can pull that out. Um, It's the New International Version, and that's okay. If you don't know where Luke is, in my Bible, just like in your Bible, there'll be a lovely page called the Table of Contents, and it's great because you can find the page numbers for where books start, Um, Go ahead and find that, find your way there, because I want you to see this for yourself. I'm not making it up. It's actually what the Word of God says. So even though my words might be a little bit differently than your translation, don't sweat it, okay? We're all on the same team. It's going to be okay. I'm going to read verses 1 through 10 for you. Jesus entered Jericho, and he made his way through the town. There was a man there named Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region, and he became very rich. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short to see over the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass that way. When Jesus came by, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, he said, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus into his house in great excitement and joy. But the people were displeased. He he has gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half my wealth to the poor, Lord, and if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. Jesus responded, Salvation has come to this home today, for this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. I'd like to pause and just pray for us this morning. Would you join me in prayer? Father, I'm thankful today that we have the opportunity to hear from you and from your word. In these next few moments, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would do whatever you'd like to do in us and through us. God, I pray that um, we would have the courage to listen to hear what you might have for us. We look forward to this experience as you unfold it before our eyes this morning. We pray this in your name. Amen. So at this point in the life of Jesus, we've kind of parachuted in about halfway, two-thirds of the way through his life. So let me give you a little bit of background and context as to where we are and how it's going to help us unpack the story from this point forward. At this point in time, Jesus has developed somewhat of a famous reputation. People would have heard about his birth story, his origin story. There was an angelic choir that sung in the heavens announcing his arrival on the planet. Pretty big deal. I think my parents got balloons. Whatever, that's cool. He had all this stuff. People would have heard that um, he was performing miracles from water to wine to healing people that couldn't walk previously and now they were able to walk to having blind people see again. In fact, just before he enters the town of Jericho, if you look up a few verses in chapter 18, you'll see that he he met a blind beggar on the road, healed that person, and so maybe that person runs into the city and said, I can see, I can see. And that would have drawn a crowd. So wherever Jesus would have went, people would have been attracted to see him. They They would have been curious, what's gonna happen next? Kind of like if a Hollywood celebrity would descend on central Alberta for some reason, vacation or shooting a movie, maybe some of us would be stirred up enough that we'd want to go to find them to see, hey, I was there when so-and-so came through my town. I got a photo, a selfie, you know, whatever it might be, we would want to be a part of it. So it's not abnormal that people are gathering. Zacchaeus would have that same curiosity as others. What else is important to know about this story before we dig into it a little bit further is where it took place. Verse 1 says the town of Jericho. Jericho. Now maybe that sounds familiar to some of you. Maybe it's because it was a television show about a couple years ago and you're like, oh yeah, I binge watched that. Maybe that's where you find uh, your sense of familiarity. It's also listed in the Bible way before then. 
in the first half called the Old Testament. In fact, it's in Numbers and in Judges. See, the origin story of the nation of Israel starts with one man and one woman that God spoke to about being a father of a, of a great nation. And this nation was to be set apart to bless all of humankind, all of creation through their very existence on the planet. The man's name was Abram. The woman's name was Sarai. They later had their names changed to Abraham and Sarah by God. And when they were initially given this promise, alongside with that promise was this set of instructions to go to the land that God was going to show them. So there's this promise of a, a great nation and a physical place where they would live, where they would grow, where it would be safe for their family to exist. And much of the Old Testament actually is their story unfolding where they they found their home, they lost their home, they found their home, they lost their home, they found their home, they lost their home, through a variety of, of means and variety of ways. And Jericho is introduced in that continuum in Judges chapter 6. At this point in time, there was a leader of the nation of Israel. It wasn't Abraham anymore. He was old. He had passed on. It was now Joshua. And Joshua was leading the people back into the region, the area they believed God had promised them. And they were coming up against some resistance. And there was one city in particular that was a, a burr in their saddle. And that was the city, the town of Jericho. Jericho was a high, fortified, walled city. They didn't have chariots. They didn't have cannon. They didn't have slingshots to get them over the walls. So they didn't know what they were going to do. When they came up to the city, they were, what are we going to do, Lord? You're asking us to take hold of this land. How do we, how do, we do this here? And God spoke to their leaders and gave them specific instructions. He said, what I want you to do is have everybody, old and young, for one, once a day, for seven days, walk around the entire city. Just march. So they did that. And then on day seven, I want you to do it seven times. And then after that, I want you to have a big celebration. I want everybody to cheer and yell and clap and scream and holler and blow horns. And when that happens, I'm going to tear down those walls and the city will be yours. So they did that, exactly God, how God told them to do it, and it happened exactly how God said it would. So the city of, of Jericho became this beacon of hope for the nation of Israel because it represented that God will tear down walls. He's gonna make a way forward where there seems to be no way. That's what it's gonna be all about. And it's no coincidence that in Luke chapter 19, we're reintroduced to this very same city. Biblical archaeologists suggest that the city of Jericho, which still is in existence today, by the way, you can go and visit it. Tourism, it's one of their highest forms of uh, revenue generating for the community. Biblical archaeologists suggest that about 20 times the city was destroyed and rebuilt over the years. So it's still there. And in this story, when Jesus enters this city, we as a reader are given that clue that, oh, something significant is about to happen in this place that represents the tearing down of walls. Something significant. Well, let's discover that together. In verse uh, two, we're introduced to a new character in this story, a man named Zacchaeus, and we're told two critical things about him. Are important to understand. Number one, he was a chief tax collector. And number two, he had become very rich. Chief tax collector, he had become very rich. During the time of this story in Luke chapter 19, the nation of Israel, although they were living in the land that God had promised them, they were not in control of their own destiny. They were subject to the Roman Empire. Maybe you studied that a little bit in school. Let me remind us, at this point in time, the Roman Empire had occupied the majority of the known world. So all throughout the Middle East, parts of North Africa, Central Europe, extending into Russia, what's modern day Russia, and even as far as the UK. That was the influence that Rome had. And they had one central authority, the city of Rome in Italy. That's where everything was dispensed from. And because it was so vast and so broad and so wide, what happened is central authority had to appoint regional representatives that represented the Caesar's interest wherever they were. And so people were familiar with these men and women that were in these roles. 
And a part of this process of becoming an empire and continuing to be an empire is they developed a vibrant taxation system. Yay! Where everybody that was a part of the Roman Empire was required to pay a certain amount of taxes in order to stay in good graces with Caesar. And if you refused, things could happen like you could lose your very life, they could sell your family to pay for your debt, they could sell your possessions, like anything was possible in that continuum. And in order to make sure that they had the right people steering the helm in this taxation environment, what they did is they created a creative job description so that the more entrepreneurial in nature would be attracted to it. The job description was this. Here's the amount of money that we need from your region. If you would like to collect more than that, you are welcome to. And anything you collect above what we need, you can keep for yourself. Hence the entrepreneurial folks attracted to this type of role. Lots of men who were locals decided to get involved. Zacchaeus was one of these people. So imagine a family member, a friend, who comes knocking on your door asking for your taxes to be paid to them. See what I'm saying? Creating some relational strain, some frustration. And the fact that the text tells us that he became very rich tells us that he did his job very well. He was also the chief tax collector, meaning he did it so well, he would train other people to do what he had been doing. He was in charge of other people. Verse three continues. It tells us that he is aware of Jesus coming into the town and he wanted to catch a glimpse of him, but he was too short to see over people. Huge significance there. I can identify with being vertically challenged, okay? So I get this in the life of Zacchaeus a little bit. My favorite sport growing up was basketball. When I told people I wanted to be a basketball player for a living, they looked at me and they just kind of like, oh, that's nice. You know, didn't happen. Vertically challenged. Sometimes you need a little bit of height to have some game in the paint. Sorry, that's just a little moment of confession there. So he's a little bit short, What's interesting to me is that normally as a a shorter man, if I'm aware of a crowd of gathering, I'm going to get there early so I can get a good spot so nobody else that's taller than me is going to be in front of me to to kind of uh, obstruct my view. I want to make sure that I have a good bird's eye view. But Zacchaeus is late to the party, probably because he's a social outcast. I don't know about you, but I have yet to invite my CRA representative over for dinner And so I can identify with Zacchaeus maybe having limited social options. So maybe he was one of the last to find out. And everybody else is gathered and he has no choice. And he's like, I can't see, so what am I going to do? And so he runs ahead along the road that he believes Jesus is going to travel down. And he climbs a tree. Climbs a tree. It was one of my favorite things to do as a kid growing up in Saskatchewan. We had four trees and I climbed all of them. It was awesome. (laughs) It It was brilliant. Loved, and I climbed trees for a variety of reasons. Sometimes I climbed a tree because, hypothetically speaking, my sister was upset about something her older brother would have done to her, and so I thought the best place to hide is up in a tree because nobody will know that I'm there. Or when I wanted to ambush my friends with ice balls, you know the snowballs that you make three days early, pour a little water on, freeze them overnight? Everybody's shaking their head. You all did that, come on. You had an ice ball war, and it's awesome when you're ambushing people from the tree. The problem is when they find out which tree you're from, you're a sitting duck. But it's still fun for about 35 seconds. It's worth it, even when you're getting pelted and you can't get down. Or you climb a tree because you want to hide. And Zacchaeus' perspective, he climbed a tree because he wanted to see. He wanted to catch a glimpse of Jesus. He wanted to be a part of an unfolding story. Just like if somebody famous came in our region and we did everything in our power to interact with him or her, to catch a glimpse of who they are. Maybe they wanted a story. Maybe Zacchaeus was just curious about seeing Jesus firsthand for himself. All these things that he had heard, could it be true that this is that guy? So he climbs a tree. And something, in my opinion, monumental takes place. 
as Jesus walks by this tree, not only sees a man in a tree, but he calls that man by his name. He says, Zacchaeus, I must come down. I must be a guest at your house today. Nowhere else in scripture are, is there recorded a previous interaction between Jesus and Zacchaeus. You know what that tells me? There are times when I read at the life, through the life of Jesus and I'm completely captivated because we've got Jesus who's fully human and fully God doing something out of the ordinary. And this is one of those moments. He is reflecting the very nature of God in this moment. The very nature of God who knows you and I by name. He knew our names before our parents gave us a name. So when we question where we belong, we need to remember that the God that created us knew about us and formed us and thought about us and has thoughts limitless about us before anybody else ever got introduced to who we are. He calls him by name. Calls him by name. If you want to create a space where people feel like they're loved, accepted, and cared for, use their name. If you like sociological experiments and you, want, you feel like your marriage is in a good spot if you're married this morning, you could try this. For the next three weeks, refer to your significant other only as wife or husband, depending on which one you're married to. See what happens. Yeah, okay, some of you maybe have tried that before. When somebody uses our name in a positive way, it initiates a positive response. See, growing up, I knew when my mom used my full name, you know, my first name, my middle name, and my last name, that meant something completely different than when my grandma used my first name only, right? There's power in knowing each other's name. There's value in that. There's value in that. Jesus has this interaction. Zacchaeus is just pumped. Here's this, this famous person who wants to spend time with him. That's awesome. Nobody else wants to hang out with me because they're probably nervous I'm going to ask for money or get them to pay the bill. But Jesus wants to hang out with me. And what's interesting to me is Zacchaeus' response to Jesus. You're going to find that in verse 8. I'm going to paraphrase for you. It says something like this. The people were upset. They were grumbling. That's verse 7, verse 8. Zacchaeus says, Lord, I'm going to give half my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody on their taxes, I'm going to pay them back four times the amount that I've cheated them on. And Jesus follows that up by saying, salvation has come to this house today. Because this man is a true son of Abraham. Which is the highest compliment that any Jewish man or woman could have received in that time period. Because it links them back all the way to the beginning of their story, to Abraham, the father of many nations, and essentially says, you are like him. And when God saw value in him, God sees value in you. Huge, monumental shift happening in this world. The social construct that would have been erected in this town of, hey, you're the people that want to take all our money. You go over there. Everybody else is going to hang out. Just got flipped upside down completely because in this one interaction, God said, it doesn't matter who you are on this planet. When you're a part of my family, there is no hierarchy. We are all equal. Everyone has value. Everyone, no matter what you've done, where you've been, or where you're going, you matter and you have value. You can belong to God's family. All you have to do is choose to be a part of it. What's interesting to me that's absent from this text is in, in no way, shape, or form did Jesus require Zacchaeus to respond in this way. There's never an ask. There's never a write, a write a number on a paper napkin, slide it across the table kind of a thing. Oh, this is your buy-in. You want in? This is what we need from you. There's never any of that. 
Zacchaeus' response is purely natural. It's Holy Spirit initiated. Here's what I mean by that. My wife and I, some of you might know this, we've had five kids grow up in our household. Yay! Five kids, it's awesome. It's a fun part of be, to be a part of. It's, it's sometimes crazy and it's sometimes quiet. More so crazy than it is quiet. And it's great. And at every, our oldest is 10 and our youngest is one. And at every stage of life, what we've learned as parents is that we've had to teach our kids how to be generous. They come out of the womb, they're the most selfish beings in the whole entire planet. There's a reason why they're so cute, these kids. Because if they weren't, we'd have a hard time as parents going like, oh man, I want to put up with you. All you do is cry, poop, eat, and repeat. Like, that's it. Where's the payoff for me? They're selfish in nature. We have to teach them how to, how to learn. Inside our brains as human beings, God puts something in there called mirror neurons. Fascinating. If you like to research stuff, research about mirror neurons. They're incredible. Essentially, they allow us to mirror the behavior that we see in others. I used to do this with my kids as they were little growing up. They'd be looking at me and I'd stick my tongue out at them till they could stink their tongue out at me. And then I was like, perfect, do that when grandpa comes. Like, that's what I wanted them to do. They mirror what they see in us. They mirror what they see in us. We've had to teach them that. If you don't believe me, here's what I would suggest you do. Crossroads kids serve in preschool one Sunday, bring one toy for 20 children. See what happens when you're like, hey, we all get to play with the same thing. We have to learn generosity. It's not a natural part of who we are. So the fact that Zacchaeus in our story is this abundantly generous tells me that God is alive and active in him. This is an act that he's doing that is beyond his own physical capability. He cannot do that. He, he can't do that on his own. That's what happens when we truly experience who God is. We do things that we are incapable of doing on our own. Not the stuff we're capable of. Not the easy stuff like somebody somebody gets mad at me and throws a punch at me, I can throw a punch at them. That's easy. But to sit back and go, somebody gets mad at me, throws a punch at me, and I'm going to pray for them, that's the difficult stuff. That's the difficult stuff. That's the stuff that only God allows us by the power of her strength alive, active in us to participate in. And that's what's happening in the life of Zacchaeus. Generosity. It's one of those things. It's it's reflected in the character of God who has given everything to us. Everything. This world, our lives, where we are, where we live, the time period, the people we journey with. Everything that we have in any way, shape, or form comes from the generous God who created us because he is generous. He didn't want to keep this all to himself. He wanted us to partake in it. He wanted us to share it with us. And so it's interesting to me that this is what Zacchaeus, his response is because he's experienced Jesus and you cannot help but be changed when you truly experience who Jesus is. There's nothing, you, you walk away changed. When people walk away from Jesus in the Bible and walk away from Jesus today, it's because they haven't experienced him. That's the truth. They haven't experienced him. When you experience Christ, you are different. No question. In fact, I would suggest you are more fully alive than you've ever been at any point in time in your life when you know Christ. Jesus values somebody, notices the unseen. There are three questions that kind of stuck with my heart as I was praying and working through getting ready for today. I want to share those with you. It's kind of the three ways that God was speaking to me through this story. The first thing that he said to me is, Jason, who is your Zacchaeus? I said, well, what do you mean? Who is the person in your life that you need to start noticing more frequently. And he spoke the name of my two oldest sons into my mind. He said, Cannon and Declan. See, sometimes in our large family, I can get busy doing things like getting the food that we need to consume, shoveling the snow, which I shoveled on Friday three times my driveway. It was awesome. I told Bonnie, hey, this is my exercise for the week. It was awesome. I can get distracted 
and God reminded me, your two sons, I've got something in mind for them and I want you to play a part in it, but I need you to notice them. I need you to notice them. So that stuck with me going like, yeah, how am I creating spaces where when they climb their trees, I see them? The second kind of question that God brought to my heart and mind is, he said, where do you need to be more like Jesus? And then I readily replied, everywhere. And he's like, no. <laughs> where do you need to be more like Jesus? See, a lot, of, a lot of the life of Jesus, a lot of the stories that we're drawn to and attracted to happened along the way to something else. Every time he traveled along the way to something else, something happened. We weren't necessarily pre-planned, like I'm gonna go there, there's gonna be this many sick people, I will heal this many, this is gonna happen. Not all of that always took place. Sometimes there's more spontaneous. And God was speaking to me about that, saying, Jason, in the places that you go, when I'm spontaneously active, that's the verbs, the words that I use, God's never necessarily spontaneous because he's always working and it's always intentional, but to me it looks spontaneous because I don't see it all the time. It's like, when I'm at work there, do you pause? Do you have time to stop, pause, and see what I'm about to do? And I thought about that. And then he brought into mind one of my favorite places to go, Superstore. Love shopping at Superstore. It's awesome. We go there, I'm like, I get my stuff. It's fun. I, I'm a little sadistic. I get it. I like shopping. Sue me. It's great. I love it. And there are times when I'm in Superstore that people recognize me and I have an option. I can like, you know, tuck my hat down, go down another aisle, try and lose them, you know, or I can see them. It happened actually with one of my neighbors is a great, lovely, big dog that loves to poop in my yard and it happened on a Superstore. I ran into this person and I'm like, yay, your dog poops in my yard. And I'm like, well, I don't want to notice you because I got to go clean up some stuff in my yard, and God's like, no, no, I want you to see them. I want you to be like Jesus. Am I willing to have my plans interrupted? Am I willing to have my plans interrupted by God at work in me, through me, or around me? And then the third question that kind of God poked at me, he said, where are you like the others in the story? And I said, what others in the story? And I had to look back. And he showed me there was people that traveled with Jesus and then there was a crowd that gathered around and saw this unfold. In fact, the, the crowd was so displeasing of Jesus' idea that they grumbled and complained that he hung out with Zacchaeus, who was a notorious sinner. And God said to me, when do you do that? When do you sit on the sideline, see what I am doing, and you grumble about it because... Maybe it's not the way that you thought it would happen. When do you sit on the sideline, watch stuff happen, and don't get involved? And I sat with that for a minute. I was like, oh, probably more than I'm willing to admit. See, the fact with this crowd and this disciple, the disciples, the people that traveled with Jesus, they missed out on everything that was happening here because they were unwilling, they were unwilling to let God be God and do what only he can do. They were unwilling to engage with what was unfolding around them. And it made me think about us as a community. Is that who we are? Are we unwilling to engage with what God wants in us and through us and around us? I don't know about you, but I don't want that to be my story. I want my kids who have these mirror neurons I want them to reflect something different when they see their mom and their dad and significant people in their world respond to what God is doing. I want that to be their normal so that when they're my age, and Lord willing, they have grandchildren or they have children who are my grandchildren and those grandchildren will be aware of and benefit from the legacy that we're creating as a people of God who respond obediently to him. So it makes me think, maybe... Maybe you're not unlike me. You not only want a space to belong, but you need to be reminded that there are Zacchaeuses in our lives that need to be noticed. There are moments in time and environments where we need to be like Jesus, and there's moments and environments where we actually have to get off the sideline and get in the game. 
be involved in what God wants. Because when we choose not to be, we miss out on so much. In John chapter 10, Jesus says it like this. I have come so that you might have life to the full or the more abundant. He's not talking about money. He's talking about what really matters in this world. He's talking about feeling like you fit and like you belong. We're gonna transition to a time of communion. We're gonna celebrate the life of Jesus because it's our only fitting response to know that we have this environment and this space and this family that he's created for us to belong to. All we can do is say thank you. And communion is that activity where we get to do this. We're gonna be doing a, a seated communion. You're gonna be served by our wonderful servers serving communion. You're gonna get a piece of bread and a, and a cup. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, we wanna encourage you to participate in this. If you've yet to make that commitment, there's no time like the present. And if God is speaking to you about belonging, being a part of what he's doing, just say yes, that's, that's easy. That's where it starts. Take a piece of bread, a cup of juice, and hang on to it. And in a few moments, I will lead us through a time of celebration together. Let me call the ushers forward, the communion servers, and let me pray for us in these next few moments. God, I pray, I pray, Lord, that you would continue to speak to us. I pray, God, that we would have not only the courage to listen, but in these next few moments, develop the resiliency needed to respond to you. And I don't know what that looks like, God. Maybe it's, maybe it's something that you're asking us to do. Maybe it's around one of these questions of where we need to be more like you or who are the Zacchaeuses in our lives or, where we're, or identifying where we're just sitting back and waiting for something to happen and not getting involved. Would you speak clearly and freely in only the way that you can? God, this is a holy moment where we get to celebrate you and we're grateful. Would you meet us here? We pray this in your name. Amen.